Let me read to you a passage from the 15th chapter of St. John's Gospel, verses 9 to 11. It's the Gospel for Thursday after the fifth Sunday of Easter. St. John writes, Jesus said to his disciples, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. That's from John chapter 15, verse 9 to 11. Our Lord says, remain in his love. You know, it is an ordinary fact of experience that if a person wishes to remain in the friendship of another, he has to be prepared to apologize for his offenses. These offenses may or may not be deliberate, but they will still offend. A mother and housewife has had a bad day and is exhausted. Her husband arrives home after a very bad day himself and irritable. He sits down for a rest, turns on the television and forgets the possible stress of his wife, expecting that she will prepare him some refreshment. They are both offended, and it is due to a mutual misunderstanding, but there is no apology from either side forthcoming. The apology would have been the occasion for a deeper love. There are many such lost opportunities as time goes on, and the relationship gradually deteriorates. It is so easy to avoid apologies, to fail to ask pardon for offences, for the simple reason that it does require humility. It is the same in society at large. A Middle Eastern country, say, bursts into civil war, and that conflagration persists for the best part of a year. It becomes evident that each side is utterly intransigent. Offence after offence is committed, one side against the other, and any thought of an apology would be virtually inconceivable. But how great would be the effect? If human beings wish to abide in the love and friendship of one another, they must learn the importance of seeking pardon for having given offences. It is perhaps impossible to avoid every form of offence, but it is not impossible to seek pardon for an offence once it is known that an offence has been given. All of this is meant as an introduction to something of maximum importance, what is required to abide in the love of God. Christ commands his disciples to abide in his love. But just as is the case with our fellow human beings, so too with God, we must be ever ready to seek his forgiveness for offences given. So important is this matter that the seeking of divine pardon features in the Old Testament scriptures and is very prominent in the New. As a matter of fact, God has institutionalized it at the threshold of our Lord's public ministry, John the Baptist pointed him out as the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Then on rising from the dead and appearing to his disciples that evening, our Lord gave them a share in his mission, together with the power to forgive sins. This is necessary if we are to remain in the love of Christ, which is the goal of life. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. The problem is that after our baptism, which unites us to Jesus Christ, which gives us a share in his divine life and sets us on the path to holiness, we fail to obey his commandments. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. We commit sin. We offend God. And so we must learn to seek God's pardon for our offences. For this purpose Christ has given to the church 
the great blessing of the sacrament of penance, the sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of forgiveness. During the Second World War, St. Maximilian Kolbe crowned his heroically Christian life by giving his life in place of a Jewish man in a concentration camp. A little under 30 years before Kolbe's generous death, there died another Catholic priest. He went down on the Titanic. But what was impressive were the circumstances. Father Thomas Biles, who lived from 1870 to 1912, the year of the sinking of the Titanic, a convert to the Catholic faith while a student at Oxford, and now a diocesan priest, was on, was on his way to America to celebrate the wedding mass for his brother William. He said mass on board on the day of the great ship's sinking. It seems that as the ship began to sink after hitting the iceberg, he moved about on deck from group to group, giving absolution and starting all the Catholics on the rosary. He heard confessions and gave absolution to more than a hundred who remained trapped on the stern of the ship after all the lifeboats had been launched. One girl survivor said that the sailors wanted to put him into a lifeboat, but he refused and went on with his work. He has three times been portrayed in films about the disaster. The point, though, is that he gave his life enabling those doomed to the waters to seek the pardon of God in the sacrament of penance. Thus they departed this life, remaining in the love of Christ. Later, Father Biles's family had an audience with Pope St. Pius X, who described him as a martyr. Father Biles, convert to the Catholic faith, knew that it was an imperative that each member of the Church have the opportunity of leaving this life having sought and obtained the pardon of God for his sins, his or her sins. This is indeed an imperative. To have confessed one's sins to God, to have sought his pardon, and most of all to be assured by the word of the Church's ordained minister that this pardon has been given, as it is in the sacrament of penance, is the source of joy. I have told you this, our Lord says, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy be complete. John chapter 15 verse 9 to 11. The forgiveness of sins is a principal reason why God sent his Son to become man and atone for the sin of the world. It is a necessary condition for abiding in God's love. Those who faced death on the Titanic and who heard the words of absolution from Father Biles knew this, as did Father Biles himself. Let us realise it too.